Akshiti Mandhavani. She is Assistant Professor, Department of English, Shivnada University. She teaches at the Department of English, Shivnada University, and her research interests include book and literary history and the history of libraries in South Asia. Her work has been published in Modern Asian Studies in South Asia, Journal of South Asian Studies. She is also the co-editor of Indian genre fiction, Past and Future Histories, that was brought out by Rutledge in the year 2019. We welcome you to the session, ma'am, and request you to take the proceedings further. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for this, uh, Bhavna. Thanks so much for the organizers for thinking, uh, you know, of me for this. And as I was telling Nishat just now, um, it's, it's like a very strange thing to, you know, do this online, to meet online. Uh, but at the same time, it's also such a joy uh, because um, I'm also taking full advantage of uh, this uh, medium. For example, I heard, um, you know, Meenakshi Yadav, your, uh, your namesake, you know, I heard her presentation this morning instead of on the 15th, you know. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, Lovely. That was another Minakshi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what she said. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay sorry. Uh, so I think I'll just get on to the presentations, uh, you know, immediately. And we all know the format is going to be 15 minutes long. I will rudely interrupt you at uh, 13 minutes. And um, then we can have the Q&A, which will be handled by Bhavna and um, so I'll just, uh, you know, introduce uh, Nishat, who doesn't need introduction in this. Uh... Uh, Akriti, this is not me. That's another Nishat. She will join ah. in a minute. Please start with the next presenter. She's ah, okay. trying to join. There's some problem in the net. Uh, okay. So can I then begin with Guntasha? Yeah. So that's the second uh, speaker. Yeah. Yes. All right. So um, Guntasha, uh, you know, let me just pull her bio up is a teacher, scholar, and a language and communication studies specialist. And she finished her bachelor's and master's from University of Delhi and shifted to Center of English Studies, JNU, to complete her research with a specific focus on Indian regional writings, colonial historiography, um, subaltern and post-colonial discourses in archival and vernacular history. She completed a doctoral degree on Sikh archives and vernacular traditions and a professor at GJV Prasad. She's presented papers at various national and international conferences and has published numerous research papers, newspaper articles, and book reviews in prominent journals and newspapers, such as The Pioneer, Indian Express, Indian Journal of Social Inquiry, etc. She has co edited John Milton's Paradise Lost, while also having authored, um, sorry, I've been, yeah, I'll return to this while having authored uh, sections on anthologies on Marquez's Chronicle of a Death Row Tool and Book Age Edition on women's writing. And she recently got published in the anthology in popular fiction, Redefining the Canon, which is a 2021 uh, book, and I'm really excited about that, for her work on Sikh vernacular histories. And her research paper on Amrita Pritam has been accepted for a forthcoming Rutledge publication. And she's also currently the main editor of the book Media and Communication Skills under Worldview. And she's also been teaching English literature and language for several years now, 11 years to be precise, and is currently working at Maharashtra Agrisen College, Delhi University. So, um, you know, Guntasha, whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Akriti, and I'm so glad I'm getting to meet you like this finally. And uh, the association with you goes really long back and uh, good to see you here. So without any further ado, uh, I'd now like to start. And uh, that small intervention was just about the fact that I wanted to screen share on my own accord. So just give me a minute before I can just get back to my desktop. So uh, yeah, just a moment, please. Just give me a moment. Is my screen visible? Yes. Right. I'll just get, get into the slideshow mode. Give me a moment, please. Uh, right. So the... I don't, where is the slideshow mode? I, I, I can't see it on my screen right now. Uh, right, okay. right on top. Right on top on the toolbar. Yeah, but, but, but some, some features seem to be a little... Uh, yeah, just a second. I think I might just... 
Kashish, I think uh, you can take over the screen share because I somehow okay. cannot locate the. Sure, the, sure, I'll do it. I'll uh, do it. So I'll just cancel this. Give me a moment, please. I'll just. For some reason I cannot. Just a moment. Give me a second. Right. So. Yeah. yeah it, or, or I think we can just, I don't know why I cannot see the screen share. I think it's. Uh, we can see your slides. If you can just keep shifting the slides, that will be fine. Yeah. So, uh, okay. I hope I'm perfectly audible. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, just to begin, uh, my paper is titled in Interrogating Colonial Historiography. Uh, looking at the traditions of vernacular via Sikh periodicals, basically uh, during the first decade of the 20th century. Uh, this has been uh, like it has been uh, introduced and given in my bio note also. It's been a part of the doctoral work that I pursued at the Center of English Studies. And I want to just begin by uh, uh, begin with a small anecdote here. Uh, when I was finalizing on my PhD research, you know, uh, the whole notion of how history comes to us as a totalistic kind of a discourse, which goes often unquestioned in classrooms and curriculum, was a, a very disturbing thought for me since school days. And I always wondered what happens to those unidentified small voices that get subdued under the baggage of history. Uh, that led to the initiation of this journey. And after visiting Punjab and some archives in Delhi and in the interiors of Punjab, uh, around eight to 10 times, I finally came across these archives, which unfortunately are not in a very good condition right now. It was very difficult to access them. But finally, when I managed to, what I saw in those periodicals and journals, basically belonging to the first few decades of the 20th century, and even the latter two decades of the 19th century, basically after the Singh Sabha movement in Punjab, you know, the journals and the newspapers that came out of it. What I saw in those newspapers literally gave me goose pimples because it gives you an alternative or a normative point of view to understand history, something that you never knew existed. And when voices and subjectivities come from people who are not big names in history and who are common voices, and of course, within the colonial setup, the native voices, the native subjectivities, the indigenous subjectivities, the common people, then it completely makes you revisit whatever you have understood about history, whatever you have understood about the times that we are living in. And it gives you a very, very sympathetic perspective to in fact, look at the debates about language, identity and culture, even in the present times. So with that, let me just begin briefly with the understanding of, understanding of colonial historiography, first of all. Now, Indians have been a curious case of living, uh, you know, by, by reproducing notions of history without any agency of their own. Uh, when you go back to the Mughal times, it's been the Persian records majorly written during the Mughal administration. I won't get into the too many nitties and gritties there because I have a lot to speak and cover today. So it's basically the Persian records that tell you what happened during the Mughal period. Right, of course, the whole language and culture aspect complicates it further because whatever was the language of the court administration and the official dissemination becomes the mode of communicating from one generation to the other. So Persian was the language of court administration during the Mughal period. And that becomes our source, the main source of understanding medieval history. Uh, moving on from that time to the British imperial narratives of the late 18th, 19th and the 20th century, the whole tradition of history writing, I mean, slightly simplistic here, but still, just to give it, give an idea that, that I'm more interested in right now, the whole tradition of British history writing or imperial narratives has been about the division, a kind of a rough division of Indian history into three, three periods with the dominance of the Sanskritic heritage in the ancient Indian context, the Persian heritage in the Mughal context, and uh, of course, English and the superiority of British cultural values later. And how British period being this phase of absolute glory for everybody that culminates in, in, in the victory of liberal democracy and constitutional values. So that's ha that has been the larger imperial narrative that we all have grown up with, you know, from uh, Elphinstone to Mill, to Bailey, uh, you know, just roughly speaking, this is how colonial historiography has been taught to us even in the post-colonial context, right? And it was really not until, pre preeminently speaking, it was really not until the upcoming of Eric Stokes and the subaltern school 
uh, majorly pioneered by the likes of Ranajit Guha, that you have a, a very significant questioning of this kind of a discourse, right? And the whole celebration of history from below, the history of the common masses, the history that prioritizes the importance of folklore, imagination, memory, oral tradition finally comes to the fore like never before. And that 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 is a very significant kind of a development in cultural studies in India uh, for more reasons than one. And it's, it's actually given people like us the impetus to pursue these kind of projects. Now, moving to the next point of interest of this paper, why is it necessary to build up or foreground a vernacular archive in order to interrogate the notions of colonial historiography. Now, I have so many people to quote, I might miss out on them because when we present, we probably can't quote everyone that's more properly done in a written paper, but just uh, at the moment, Hans Harder, you know, Hans Harder's works have been just reading very recently, Sheldon Pollock and uh, Patha Chatterjee. Patha Chatterjee, Chatterjee has actually written a recent book on vernacular history, the whole notion of the vernacular archive. And that book is all about, you know, these small, small stories from India's regions. So he talks about the necessitation of posing a vernacular archive in order to not necessarily interrogate colonial historiography, but maybe to understand your own roots slightly more better. Now, the vernacular archive and the whole notion of vernacular archive has a very interesting kind of a place in India's literary history. And I'd really like to go back to, amongst so many people who've said so many things over these two and a half days, uh, Professor G.N. Devi's inaugural speech is something that I'd just like to briefly sort of mention a few things that he said there. You know, uh, the whole notion of vernaculars in India has been very interesting and peculiar for so many reasons. One, in every phase of India's history, and my upbringing has been on G.N. Devi and Shishir Kumar Das and Suniti Kumar Chatterjee. So by default, maybe a lot of things that I will say, you'd feel that you've heard them from them before, but, but, but I've pretty much, you know, sort of grown up my research on them. So, so just to kind of go back to G.N. Devi again, you know, the different phases of India's literary history has had a very peculiar position of India's regional languages, beginning from the celebration of the Pali and the proper tradition, right? That contest Sanskritic tradition, and that has also been behind the nourishing of the upper Brahmsa culture. Uh, to uh, the, the actual very seminal role that these regional traditions played during the Bhakti movement, uh, you know, in terms of questioning so many things about caste, social structure, and gender, and to finally taking a position of being this individually very narrative and literary traditions uh, coming to the point of the 19th century when everything transforms, you know, uh, because of the missionary effort and because of the efforts of the colonial administration and because of a certain kind of nationalism that gives a new sort of a sense to these vernacular languages coming together in terms of making contributions to education, literature and journalism. You know, like Sir Devi so rightly said, uh, imposition of one single language has not been able to submerge or to repress the individual distinctive identity of what were labeled as vernaculars in the pre-colonial or in the, in the British colonial and then erstwhile to that, the, the colonial context basically. Right, interestingly, now when we talk about a vernacular archive, we talk about these voices, these regional voices that had begun to respond to a uh, domination of English in language and administration in very interesting ways. And fascinatingly, a lot of the literary historiography that has been done in post 1947 times by stalwarts like Shishir Kumar Das, Suniti Kumar Chatterjee, G. N. Devi himself, uh, so many names, not everybody's coming to my mind right now, but yeah, these three or four mainly, has again given us an encouragement to be able to relook at, at the importance of vernacular subjectivities and why there is a need to reconsider them on a completely new basis. And that sort of an advent or that sort of a vantage point vis-a-vis -vis literary historiography raises fascinating questions about how simplistically colonial historiography uh, passes on ideas and its emblems to us. Now, coming to the case of Punjabi language, because that has been that is at the center of this paper, really, and I might just move to the next slide now. Uh, a lot of these things that you're 
scenes, dialogue, and a presentation. I had basically taken it from J. L. Davies book, from one of his book books there. Now you'd see that he's actually encapsulating the major developments in the regional languages of the Indian subcontinent vis-a-vis -vis the main milestones that were achieved in the medieval times, right? Uh, as in the first seminal composition and, and, and so on, the recitational traditions during the Bhakti movement and so on. Now Punjabi's case has been no different. Uh, as 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 compared to other regional languages, it's been a similar story, you know. Uh, the initial sort of a sort of an in the Punjabi language emerges with the Sarasani Upper Brahmsa, and the traditions in Punjabi compositions are to be taken back to Sheikh Farid's compositions in 12th century. So though he composed in the Multani dialect, but nevertheless, we are looking at in terms of history, we're looking at him as the first initial composer. Significantly, when we're looking at Punjabi language, we cannot ignore the aspect of script because language are obviously in the case of Punjabi, the whole issue becomes a little bit more complicated because Punjabi was spoken both in the Gurumukhi and the Shahamukhi script in the pre-1947 context of the undivided Punjab. Right. And of course, the whole uh, thing about the Shahamukhi script went on the other side. India attained independence. But we, when you're looking at language and its connection to script, that happened, as we all know, I believe, by our knowledge of common medieval Indian history, that happened during the period of Sikh guruship. The centuries between 15th to the 18th century, roughly speaking, uh, again, uh, pretty much within the, you know, as a part of the Bhakti movement, as a part of the general social and cultural reform, the Punjabi compositions arose out of the Gurumukhi alphabet that was gradually designed by the Sikh gurus and that finally found a place in the Adi Granth, the sacred scripture of the, of the Sikhs, right? After that, we've had majorly the predominance of the ballet and the poetic tradition, pioneered by the Sufi compositions of the like of Varis and Gulesha. And there's been, of course, the pallid tradition of hagiography writing and writing about Sikh sacred lit literature on the lives of Sikh gurus post that. And like, as has been said enough by now, it was the 19th century that was the game changer. Uh, sorry, the, that's not, I have so, to interrupt uh, for a second. Yeah, yeah, I'll, Can you, I'll, I'll, uh, over right. 10 minutes. So right, right. So so I'll I'll, I'll just I'll just I'll just come straight away to this to this part of the periodicals that I want to talk about. And Akriti, just allow me to finish this because this is a very valuable point of insight that I wanted to share. Now, the 19th century was the point of transformation, and enough has been talked about it, the efforts made by missionary enterprise and so on. Singh Sabha movement that arose in 1873, mainly from the centers of Amritsar and Lahore, like Aligarh movement in the Muslim community, and like you know, uh Arya Samaj within the Hindu community was a movement about concretizing debates related to Sikh education, Sikh journalism, and Sikh literature like never before. There was a multi layered discourse of embracing colonial modernity, but then at the same time also preserving what is so local and native to you all. Right now, these are journals, as you can see, I'm going to sift them from the latter half of the 19th century to the first decade of the 20th century. They're all written in Gurumukhi. Uh, they were published on a regional basis. The missionaries had a lot of contribution to made during the middle part of the 19th century in giving an impetus to initial Punjabi publishing. But as you can see, they hardly attracted any kind of a colonial patronage. Uh, and they were basically meant for internal circulation within the community with debates pertaining to language. I wanted to read the headlines of some of them. This is an article, for example, about Gurumukhi language, uh, Gurumukhi script and Punjabi language. Uh, there are articles about Sikh educational conferences, there are articles about what happens in Khalsa colleges, there are articles about how British modernity is so admirable, but maybe we would not want to be like them. This is three satsang, the journal that you see right in front of you has debates about women empowerment, women education. So all these debates are becoming a part of the popular community consciousness. And fascinatingly, they're also tying up with the movement towards what becomes active nationalism in Punjab in the first part of the 20th century in the form of the Gadar and the Akali movement. Now, uh, my research became important uh, for this uh, primary, primary reason that no one had actually talked about this before. These journals were absolutely undiscovered. And when I opened them, they gave me a completely distinctive point of looking at the same historical events from a perception and from a subjectivity that was community-based, very, very strongly centered in language and rituals within the Sikh community, but at the, at the same time have, having the potential of building up a very, very strong vernacular archive that enables you to look at 
colonial historiography with that kind of a skeptical viewpoint, which gives us the right perspective to view the sociolingual debates in the post-1947 context as well. I, I hope, I, I wish I would have been able to show them to you in a more better way if I had more time, but if you actually see, this is one of those very rare journals, which was a Sikh English journal. And this was one of the rare examples of a journal having British patronage, the Khalsa Advocate. And if you see, this is again, one of those rare examples of a journal having advertisements, because a lot of these community journals did not have advertising revenue. They were just locally supported by the efforts of Sikh, Sikh intellectuals who were part of the Sikh Sabha movement. And for a rare case like the Khalsa Advocate that is having colonial patronage, you can see the difference from packaging itself. So thank you. Thank you so much. And, and I hope I was able to convey the best what I had to. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Kuntasha. You know, my interest in uh, periodicals, I will hold off uh, questions of my own and perhaps we can have questions from, you know, people if there are any. <laughs> yes, I'm sure they're typing in the uh, questions while the process of a very comprehensive talk. <laughs> so perhaps, you know, if I uh, were allowed to, if I may, um, I was wondering, uh, you know, you made this very important point about advertisements. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've seen in the case of my own uh, work on, you know, in the periodicals is that there is a big point that is made on periodicals not accepting advertisements, mm -hmm. right? And they, they, they're almost like proud of the fact uh, yeah. that they are not uh, acquiescing to these right. market right. concerns or drives that they're ideologically yeah. very... Uh, you know, driven by their own uh, considerations. Mm -hmm. So you see that happening in your journals? Uh, you did make that point. I found that yes, you know, uh, whatever I, I uh, got source about their history and background, a lot of them uh, were obviously making a point about being very, very conscious about indigenously locating themselves and hence they had to reject a lot of the colonial patronage and colonial support but a lot of them also tried and endeavored but could not get colonial patronage because obviously these are not newspapers like you could see of national significance they're very very they have many a times even area and locality bound also and pretty much within the same community you know not not even within within Punjab also not even sort of uh, looking looking at Punjabi Muslims Punjabi in the Guru Mukhi script and hence circulating within the Sikh community themselves but yes by and large a lot of them were very conscious about also a part of something known as the Tat Khalsa movement, where, where a very, very staunch kind of a kind of an identity assertion in a Gurumukhi and, and, and the whole debate about Sikh si Gurdwaras and, and exegesis of the sacred literature, they wanted to restrict it. Uh, within the community and hence advertising revenue was even discouraged. So it's not that you don't have advertising at all. In fact, interestingly, in some of these, you have these small, small local advertisements made by hand, like a harmonium, which is out for sale, you know, within within the maybe the same region, for example, or the same area. So there is some kind of local little bit advertising here and there. But of course, like a massive advertising revenue, as you see in the case of Khalsa Advocate, was not the case for most of them. Consciously so, most of them. Uh, yeah. I think I'll... Uh you know, ask Sangu and Bhavna to take over. Yeah. Sure. Um, thank you for the paper, Guntasha. You have um, a question that is asking you whether you could probably uh, elaborate on... Um, yeah, okay. I keep losing this. Yeah, so um, the question asks you whether you have any record of bilingual journals at all. And it also comments that in Marathi, the first print newspapers are symmetrically bilingual. Uh, yes. But then the timeline that they mention is 1830. So would you like to comment upon that? Yes, you know, interestingly, uh, uh, there hasn't been a case of bilingualism within the same journal. So for example, Khalsa Advocate is purely English. The, all the other journals that I've shown you belonging to the same period are primarily in Punjabi. So within the same journal, bilingualism is not there. But yes, across the journals, across the journal, one from one to the other, you see instances of some English Sikh journals also being prevalent during the same period. Right. And so there are there any instances of, let's say, the same people who were involved starting separate Punjabi and English newspapers? Yes. Uh, yes. And the question cites like what Margaret spoke of Urdu and Marathi Kesri by yes. Tilak. So right. any parallels so, there? Yes. Very interesting example is Bhaivir Singh. So uh, Bhaivir Singh was behind Khalsa Samachar and Bhaivir Singh was 
very, very uh, uh, comfortable in English and Punjabi both. And he started not just Khalsa Samachar, that's of course his most well-known journal, but he started many other journals. Some were in Punjabi, but a lot of them were prominently in English also, and in his own writings also as the chief spokesperson of Chief Khalsa Divan. You know, he wrote in English quite sufficiently, but but in the case of Punjabi, those examples are less. You, I mean, I mean, writing in Punjabi in the Guru Mukhi script was a very consciously fashion choice. So even if you knew English or you could write in English or be comfortable with bilingualism, you'd still want to use Punjabi language in the Guru Mukhi script because that's a part of the whole very, very, very organized kind of a movement that arises out of the Singh Sabha and that is a part of the Guru Dwara reform later as well. But yes, Pai Vee Singh is one such example. Okay. Um, Professor uh, Nishad Zaidi is commenting that Urdu was declared to be the vernacular language of Punjab by the colonial administration. Right. And uh, so how did Punjabi journals respond to it? Oh, okay. I don't remember because it's, it's, it's like I completed all this in 2016. So I don't remember any particular, uh, you know, one off case as such, but there was a lot of in the general prose works of Punjabi that were written during this period, there was a kind of a resistance uh, uh, to this whole thing about Urdu, uh, you know, taking a prominent place, uh, at, you know, in terms of being declared as the main Punjabi vernacular or as the main vernacular in the Punjab. But in these journals specifically, really, I don't recall an example. Maybe when I'll go again, uh, as a part of my monograph exercise, I'll try to find this one angle. But yes, in a lot of the treatise works that come out of that period, and even the ones that are later written later, for example, the prominent ones by Farin Amri Mir and so many other related critics, you do see this very strong kind of a resistance that happens to Urdu being a part, being a vernacular, being declared a vernacular in the Punjab and the kind of socio-political administrative, administrative ramifications that it has for the Punjabi Sikh community uh, during that period. So you spoke of Han Sagar and he has uh, said something to, to your yeah. paper. He says yeah. Punjabi is one of the multi-scripted languages, but I guess the symbolical value of Guru Mukhi outdid the others. And he asks, are any traces of Shah Mukhi or even Nagari? But I think you mentioned Shah Mukhi. Would you like to comment upon Nagari as well? Uh yeah, so Nagari uh, script is not really connected to this discussion at the moment because Nagari script is, is as we know, was, you know, majorly what, what the Hindi journals and periodicals would have been written in. Uh, in fact, when I was looking at these journals, because I was very conscious of tracing the Guru Mukhi and the Sikh journals, I couldn't see instances of Shah Mukhi also. So vis-a-vis -vis the script, there has been a very, you know, out of the Singh Sabha movement of the Sikh intellectuals, you see a very consciously fashioned kind of a choice with regard to the script, which is that of the Guru Mukhi, really. No instance of Nagari or Shamuki that I can think of as a part of this research. That I could Thank you recall. so much, Gansha, that uh, indeed gave birth, a very wide birth of debates. Uh, with the chair's permission then, can we move on to the next, next speaker, ma'am? Uh, yes, and I was wondering if we could go back to uh, Dr. Nishad Zedi or would you go to the... Pro pro Professor Nishad Heather. Heather. Okay, right. so do we go to Paul first or do we? Yes, continue? yes, that we can do that. We can do that. Right. So, uh, you but know, Ashram, just... can you try to uh, stop sharing your screen? Meanwhile, while uh, Dr. Uh, Manjwani introduces is this, is this... Professor yeah, Heather. Yeah, sorry. All right, so um, we go to our second uh, speaker for today, uh, Dr. Nishad Heather. Uh, and uh, is a professor of English at Jamia, and um, she is the author of uh, Tyranny of Silences, Contemporary Indian Women's Poetry, and she served as a director, Institute of Women's Studies, University of Lucknow, and um, she's a recipient of many academic awards, including the Minakshi Mukherjee Prize, uh, the C.D. Narsamaya Award, and Isaac Sakiera uh, Memorial Award. And she's presented uh, papers at numerous academic conferences and her essays have been, um, you know, um, published in a variety of scholarly journals and books. And uh, she's also um, conducted several seminars on uh, gender budgeting and gender sensitization and um, on various projects funded by the Ministry of Women and Ch Child Development, UNICEF, UGC and other agencies. And she's lectured extensively on subjects on the intersection of cinema, culture and gender studies, and her current research interests include post-colonial studies, translation, popular culture, and gender studies. Over to you, uh, Professor Heather. And uh, again, I'll interrupt you around the 10 minute mark, and uh, we stop at 15. 
So the time allotted to me is 10 minutes or 15 minutes? It's 15. I'll uh, stop you at 10. Okay. Yeah. You. Give me a verbal cue because I don't uh, look at the chat box while reading from my I'll do that. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the title of my paper is Reconfiguring the Language Ideologies and Identity, a Study of Amida Riyaz's Tum Kabir. Now, uh, although Pakistani English literature is well recognized globally, the diversity of vernacular language literatures in Pakistan, that is in Punjabi, Pashto, Sindhi, Saraiki, and Baloch, uh, besides, of course, creative works in Urdu, which is the national language, uh, this complication, this complexity makes the issue of the post-colonial voice a complex one. Now, delineating necessary dialogue between the intersecting veins of language vernacularity, vernacularity and the literature from a post-colonial perspective, this paper looks retrospectively at Fahmid Riyaz, the Pakistani progressive Urdu writer, Fahmid uh, Marxist feminist and poet whose life and works echo those very nuances of Bhutan, that is own, Sakafat culture, as well as the conflict between Makami or Omi Zaban, that is vernacular and national languages, which are complicated by the writer's ideological, identitarian, and uh, gender uh, positioning. Um, so, um, I would skip this whole portion of vernacular, what is meant by that in vernacularity. Uh, but I would, um, over here, I would acknowledge a vast range of meanings and context of the term vernacular. And while acknowledging, uh, you know, this entire array of meanings and context of the term vernacular, I would frame the vernacular in Riyaz's Tum Kabi to address issues around politics, semiotics and representation to open up fruitful conversations, not only around the relationship of the vernacular to the national, but also about comparative work and techniques in Urdu poetry in South Asian literatures. Uh, Tum Kabir, published in the year 200, uh, 2017, is the seventh collection of poems of Femi Darya's who challenged both the traditional form and mediums that have dominated Urdu poetry since its inception. Describing the many facets of Femi Riyaz in uh, the introduction to Tum Kabir, the renowned writer Masood Ashar asks, does Femi Riyaz need an introduction? Is it necessary to describe her as a renowned poet and accomplished short story writer, a trustworthy and impeccable translator, or a passionate human rights activist? Is it not enough to say that Femi Riyaz is Femi Riyaz? There is no one like her, unquote. Indeed, she has no parallel in South Asian uh, poetry. But uh, uh, since any attempt to address issues around politics, semiotics, and representation to the vernacular requires mapping out the negotiations of the multiple actors, their interests, and concerns over the physical environment and its con uh, contradictory forces, it is imperative to map out the affective, creative, contextual, and ideological contours of Riyadh's trajectory. Born a year before partition of the Indian subcontinent near Delhi, Femida Riyadh was taken to Pakistan by her parents as an infant. Femida Riyadh has 14 books of prose and poetry in print, and she gave frequent poetry recitals. She's known for her feminist views and strong commitment to social justice, democracy, and human rights. The books of poetry that she has published include Patthar Ki Zaban, Badan Darida, Kya Tum Purana Chan Na Dekhoge, Apna Jirm Sabit Hai, and Mai Mitti Ki Murat Hu Mitti Prefess. With a warm personal note about her support for uh, uh, transnational scholarship between uh, India and Pakistan, between Hindi and Urdu needed to be undertaken. Besides the books of poetry, she has authored, translated, and edited several books of prose, Adhura Admi, Khalqai Mizanjeer Ka, Kule uh, Dariche Se Pakistani Literature and Society, Zinda Bahar, Gudabi, and Karachi. She also served as a literary editor for the socio political monthly journal Ava. She lived in Pakistan in 1982 and served as poet in residence at the Jamia Millia Islami University in New Delhi for one year between 1982 and 1983. Riyaz's work, her liberal sensibility, and a Marxist feminist identity that she asserts for herself is shocking to the obscurantists of the religion. Uh, and religious fundamentalists in Pakistan, 
Furthermore, her identity as a Muhajir or migrant from Pakistan as not fully Pakistani is always fraught with the potential of an unpatriotic identification with India. Pemindar Riaz wrote poetry during the martial law in Pakistan uh, from 1977 to 1988, and the feminist critiques of the state are informed by political ideologies, aesthetic strategies, and identitarian allegiances. Furthermore, Pemindar Riaz showed self-exile in India during the first eight years of martial law, and her, hence her poetry and politics are mediated by her experiences and extent personal choices. When traveling through India in the 1980s, Pemida Riaz writes that she found many cultural resonances between Sindhi, the language of her home, and the village speech in Uttar Pradesh. Riaz draws from common storehouses of memories and experiences that are expressed in the language of the respective homes. She understands that the only way to escape hegemonic processes of the, uh, domination and rule is to become fluent in each other's histories, form unlikely coalitions, and be precise about the power, biases, or even privileges of one's location so that any ensuing dialogue will be ethical and critically engaged. Engaging the medium of poetry is a counter discourse against state hegemony and feminist critiques of nationalism. Riaz offers a poetics of resistance. When Riaz was working as the editor of the magazine Avaz, she came under the scrutiny of the government due to her publishing activities, and there were 14 cases of sedition filed against the magazine. In 1982, when she was charged with sedition, she went into exile to India. And then she went back to Pakistan in 1988, um, uh, only, uh, the same year that the Chief Marshal Law Administrator and the Pakistan General Zia Haq died in a uh, plane crash. Uh, now, coming back to um, uh, Tum Kabir, Tum Kabir uh, the last, uh, her last collection, her anthology of poems, charts out the overlapping contours of Femida Riaz's political, ideological, and aesthetic dreams, which underscore the fraught negotiations between feminist consciousness and nationalist ideology. The issues that Riaz engages with, the, with in, in this collection of Nazam's uh, free or blank poems in varying intensity include the question of memory, history, politics, freedom of speech, right to equality, nationalism, culture, religion, gender, war, class struggles in the construction of the self as well as the other and its ramifications for women. The choices of poetic genres are intertwined with the different voices the poet wishes to project and protect. The book of Nazims that Riyadh had penned between 2001 and 2015. It also includes some Nazims which had been written earlier but could not be published. Riyadh had planned, planned to call this anthology of poems Masamo Kedairim. But she lost her son Kabir while he drowned while swimming with friends on a picnic in October 2007. And therefore, in order to preserve his memory, she named the book Tum Kabir. The opening poem of the book titled Tum Kabir can be compared to Alama Iqbal's Javid Nama, published in 1932. Uh, it's a Russian book of poetry in which uh, Alama Iqbal has addressed, addressed his son Javid. Running into many pages, Tum Kabir is the longest poem uh, in the collection. In Tum Kabir, Riyaz's rigor manages to hold together a heterogeneous, seemingly diverse mix of poems on, the, uh, on various issues, varied themes and subjects, um, you know, faith, faithfully transcribed uh, dreams and desires, as in the poem, uh, poems, uh, Nay Dictionary and Naya Fesla, Tariq in Isma Ke Liye. Uh, uh, memories of other poets uh, in uh, Josh Maliabadi and by John Ilya Kelly, reminiscences in Rehman Baba, musings on family members, Tum Kabir, Ammi, and Suno Suleiman, uh, poems on political figures like Salam Benazir, Bhagat Singh Ki Murat, and Aung San Chuki Yenam, uh, poems on destructive impact of materialism and capitalism, Cho Suang, Gui, Ek Mukalama, uh, Kasairim Davis, and Muskurao Palvashe. Poems on socio-political meditations, um, Naya Bharat, Pokhran, Chahli, Karachi, Aman Ki Asha, Baghdad Se Pehli, Bambari, and Saddam Hussein or Ahmed Ali, amongst many others. The following lines from the poem, Bhagat Singh Ki Pura, um, uh, very evocatively uh, show her take on contemporary politics and her acerbic uh, uh, humor and sparkling wit. Um, and here I 
uh, read out uh, you know excerpts from a poem bhagat singh ki murad delhi se khabar aayi hai duhai hai duhai hai parliament complex mein shaheed bhagat singh ki sarkari shilpkar ne hi kaisi chhabi banayi hai are hi hi ye to bhagat singh nahi हाय हा 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 प्यारे मित्रों रोना बंद करो जरा इस पार्लियामेंट में दूसरी मूर्तों को भी गौर से देखो क्या ये वो जवाहर लाल है जो वो था वही गांधी है वही अबुल कलाम आजाद इनकी असल सूरत और आत्मा तो इस पार्लियामेंट में आने जाने वाले कप के ऑमलेट बनाकर खा पी, पी चुके उसका जमाना बीत गया वो जो गालिब का आशिक था शेर व शायरी का रसिया अब गालिब भी गालिब है और आंख मार मार के गजल गा रहे हैं ऐश्वर्या राय जिस पर नाच रही हैं उनकी मेहरबानी और उसके शहर लाहौर में भगत सिंह एक सिख है ज्यादातर लोगों के लिए जो शायद सन सैतालीस में वहां से चला गया ऐसे नाम सुनकर लोग घबरा जाते कम्बक कहीं वापस तो नहीं आ रहा अपनी प्रॉपर्टी क्लेम करने सो अबाउट and this heterodox way of constructing a book is in itself a tactic to transcend the hackneyed themes and romantic styles of women's writing and to mock certain pernicious conventions of pakistani society and culture tragically use poetry not only to find a critical voice but also to challenge authoritarian garments decrying nuclear tests by the clashes and increasing militarization of the poems of manki asha and pokhran or, uh, or chavi makes for sensitive and thoughtful reading overflowing with sparkling wit and humor aman ki asha exposes the political and economic stakes of both india and pakistan in militarizing the border and stoking war cries behind the seemingly comic banter in aman ki asha of an ideological work that makes a plea strong plea for reconciliation and uh, harmony in the devastatingly satirical line tum bilkul hum jaise nikle ab tak kahan chupe the bhai riyaz compared the use of hindutva in india with the rise of islamic fundamentalism in pakistan now in urdu poetry riyaz us tum kabir is an example of a radical initiative with a distinctively feminist marxist political perspective which underscores the breaches between a hegemonic nation state and its others in poems like salam uh, benazir on sanchu ki ke naam mein muskurao palvashe riyas constructs the image of women who are strong and yet compassionate concurrently capable of nurturing and loving at the same time as fighting against against unjust practices and oppressive political social economic forces that subjugate men and women uh feminine riyas choices of subjects and poetic genres are intertwined with the different voices she wishes to uh, project and uh, uh, protect in hazrat zainab ka khud bash ke darbar mein riyas described the historical incident after the battle of karbala on the western bank of the euphrates about 35 miles from al kufa in which imam hussein the grandson of prophet muhammad was martyred uh, the poem symbolizes imagery from marsia and elegiac form of poetry particular significance to shia community in the indian subcontinent and um, interestingly or uh, the poem uh, ends with the declaration of defiance uh, uh, from bibi zainab and becomes some kind of a commentary on uh, the prevalent um, uh, um, exploitation of women in pakistan and a word of um, yes uh, i'll read out just a few lines samne tukre hue जिन सब प्यारों के तन छोड़कर आई थी मैदान में लाशों के कफन बेपना सदमों की शिद्दत पर सफर वो पुर महा इस कदर मजलूमियत पर ऐसा खुतबा और जलाल मिल नहीं सकती हमें तारीख में ऐसी मिसाल पेश करती उन्हें इंसान या जरी खराज आलमी नस्मा के सर पर आपने रखा है ताज सो इन दाइनल thus making me zain up as a feminist icon of her times so i am the real this poetry is a weapon that spares nothing and no one including its own author i would like to end my paper uh, with a poem titled kemida riyas ek shaira log kehne lage hain ki mashhoor hain 
कभी दिल में आता है मैं भी मिलूं मगर बात ये है कि मशहूर और मरूफ लोगों से मिलने की चाहत मेरे दिल में ना है और ना कभी होगी यू भी कहने में आता है इस तरह की हस्तियों से अगर आप सचमुच मिले तो मायूस होते हैं अक्सर इन में मगर मुँह जबानी कई याद है सुना दू जो मुझसे कहें बस इतना ही काफी है इतनी शाना साई शायरा से बहुत है मेरी इनके होने न होने से है बेनियाज जिंदगी मेरी हर सिम फैली हुई थैंक यू वेरी मच ऑल दो देर लॉट टू रीड एंड लॉट टू टॉक अबाउट बट सिंस दिस पॉजिटिव ऑफ टाइम आई वुड लाइक टू एन माई पेपर प्रेजेंटेशन वेरी मच Thanks so much, uh, Professor Heather, for that uh, riveting presentation. I see we already have a couple of questions, so I'll quickly hand this over to Sangu and Bhavna. You know, if you would. Yeah. Bhavna, can you read out both the questions? Together? I will do that. I will do that, ma'am. The first question is from Professor Zaidi. She asks, did Urdu poets and fiction writers collaborate in nation states' efforts to purify Urdu as a unique carrier of Islamic identity? or did they resist and counter it where would you place riyaz in this and then she goes on to ask in becoming national language did urdu lose its position as a nation language a uh, breath with term vernacular in another word and how did otherwise iconoclastic feminist writers respond to this uh, should i ask both questions together and you'd like to comment or uh, can we do it one by one so uh, both, both, both the questions day. both questions okay Uh, another question is from my co-rapporteur Sango Bidani he asks would you say that the choice of languages and the diversity of themes an attempt to not only find similarities between cultures but also an attempt to locate herself outside the bounds of nationalisms so ma'am the uh, first um, go to uh, professor Nishad Zaidi's question and she says did urdu poets and fiction writers collaborate in nation states efforts to purify urdu as a unique um bulk of them did i mean it's really really ironical that urdu which was um, uh, used as an instrument as a tool by the progressive writers in undivided india to fight against colonialism to rebel against uh, the Uh, colonial masters uh, was used in um, uh, independent pakistan uh, to iron out all the differences of uh, uh, cultures and languages within pakistan itself within the muslim community and to seek some kind of an artificial unity and herein lies you know uh, you know the, the entire basis on which pakistan as a nation state was built Uh, herein lies you know uh, the fact that shows you the major fractures you know so yes and where would you place riyaz in this and riyaz uh, you know uh, though she was herself a uh, part of uh, uh, many co uh, committees and many movements to fight for um, uh, the rights and um, of the indigenous languages of the various other vernacular languages and especially sindhi because uh, uh, she she wrote and she spoke in sindhi too uh, but she did her creative writing in urdu and uh, she was you know accused many times uh, in her lifetime as to uh, why when she fought for the rights of the other languages to prosper within pakistan and um, as legitimate languages of the people and as leg legitimate uh, language of expression and uh, creative writing why did she herself forsake sindhi and um, she of course gave her own set of um, uh, logical reasoning which i find very faulty and deceptive because uh, you know at the end of it a writer wants to be read and um, widely read and urdu you know is spoken not only the in the subcontinent but uh, there are urdu speakers in the rest of the world also uh, especially those who have migrated from undivided india uh, to the various parts of the world so um, riyaz you know um, has um, uh, she occupies a very unique position vis-a-vis -vis this debate 
and in becoming national language did urdu lose its position as nation and any language you know how i mean as jn devi uh, spoke in his inaugural lecture that uh, only that society is very vibrant alive and um, uh, interesting uh, in which uh, you find that uh, in which you find uh, plurality of um, conventions and cultures and you know uh, multilingualism is something that should be celebrated which is something that you know the debate surrounded we are confronting and in country in india today and which um, had been very much a part of the debate and many many movements uh, since the birth of pakistan itself so how did otherwise iconoclastic feminist writers respond uh, to this ma'am i'm so sorry to intervene but uh, maybe we can take the discussion forward a little later and move on to the next yeah, presenter yeah. i'm sure, so sorry sure. please go ahead uh, all right uh, i think i'll just move uh, immediately to minakshi yadav and uh, she is an assistant professor at shivaji college university of delhi and a phd scholar at the department of english at uh, jamia millia samia and she has received her MPhil degree from Department of English University of Delhi and her research interests include hindi journalism in 19th century india dalit studies subaltern studies and cultural studies so again at the 10 minute mark i will emerge yeah thank you dr mandwani so i'll start right away without wasting much of my time thank you thanks a lot so the title of my paper is standardization and vernacularization of hindi A study of the history of growth and development of Hindi language unfolds as the narrative of the standardization and vernacularization of the language. The presentation also intends to dive deeper into the cult, uh, historical, cultural, and political discourses that shape the contours of the language. Paper will strive to trace the journey of Hindi by looking at its presence in Hindi print media. The introduction of modern means of communication. print technology railways and postal services not only ascribe mobility to the information discourses and people but also initiated a totalizing phenomenon that stimulated people to coagulate as uh, communities a religious relig uh, religious national hindu um, in hindi that would be jati sanghatan like bhartiya jati hindu jati aryan jati rajput jati muslim jati these uh, modern means of information diffusion created a a uh, chaos between the textual and oral the history of hindi language is one example where the textual is privileged over oral oral discourses <clears throat> a study of hindi periodicals magazine seem to alleviate such gaps in historiography from announcing the important community and national events to urging the readers to spread the word by mouth the, the these journals they managed to bridge the gap between the older and modern communication that for uh, networks my research explores vernacular print journals as a primary archival source born in rewari in 1865 balmukund book was proficient in many languages including hindi urdu english arabic persian acquisition of so many languages came naturally to him owing to his birth in a multilingual society where languages were not yet conceptualized as bounded systems he got his early education in urdu and started to write in eminent urdu magazine avat panch in 1883 After a successful stint at Awadh Panch he wrote and edited many Urdu magazines journals and newspapers like Madhur Akhbar Akhbar e Chunar Kohi Noor however he learnt hindi with time and the historical meeting with pandit madan mohan malviya at second bharat dharma mahamandal in english that would be an indian religious organization in 1889 commenced a lifelong correspondence with malviya and his career in hindi journalism later on he went uh, he went on to write in bangwasi bharat mitra uh, hindi bhasha interestingly he, he was terminated in 1891 since the owner of hindustan did not approve of his anti colonial articles he joined bharat mitra as editor editor in 1891 where he translated many texts from bengali to hindi and from uh, hindi to urdu although he proclaimed his love for urdu by calling it his mosheri bhasha Uh, that would be language from mother's side he acknowledged the relevance of hindi as the national language and devoted his life in passion in the correct expression of hindi the history of hindi journalism uh, is replete with such instances where multilinguality was a norm of the writers and characterized the cultural production 
Pope's biography brings to light many historical phenomena that largely remained unacknowledged. First, dedication to a Hindi movement did not necessarily mean separation from Urdu, since many journalists slash writers wrote in more than one language throughout their lives. Journals followed this multilingual or rather bilingual leg leg legacy until late in the 19th century. Unlike the conventional historiography that tends to chart separate histories for Hindi and Urdu journalism, which gives, which gives way to a false assumption about the absence of any overlap overlapping space between the two languages, I propose that journalism was one of the many avenues where Hindi and Urdu languages interspersed and coexisted together until late 19th century. Third, the journalism in the late 19th to early 20th century was not only about nationalism, but also about uh, reorganization of other is isms based on caste and religion. Uh, it must be admitted or tried that the history of Hindi journalism cannot be demarcated systematically with each phase manifesting uh, essential characteristics. Nonetheless, the paper somewhat yielding to the convention identifies three overlapping phases to delve deeper into the social, cultural, and political discourses that contributed <clears throat> to the emergence of journalism in late 19th to early 20th century. The traces, gaps, breaks, and overlapping exist in all the phases where examples like Babu Mal, Babu Mal Bukun Kukt interrogate uh, the conventional understanding of Hindi public sphere. My paper acknowledges the presence of Urdu public sphere along with the Hindi public sphere and presumes that the two engaged with each other throughout. The story of Hindi journalism starts from Bengal for Renaissance found, uh, found its way in India from the land of, land of Bengal only. So Sirampur Press was definitely not the first press, but as B.S. Case One uh, believes, he, uh, it was a pioneer in respect of subject, quality, and quantity. Sirampur Press published journals in English, uh, uh, Bengali, and Hindi. In English, uh, they published circular letters, Digdarshan. In, in Bengali, they published periodical accounts and Digdarshan. In Hindi, they published Digdarshan. Considerably, the Darshan was published in all these languages, in all, all the three languages. Uh, Kerry taught uh, Persian and Sanskrit in Fort William College and translated many religious texts in Nagari, Persian, Arabic, Sanskrit, Bengali, and other languages. Although Sirampur Press was established to popularize the Christian scriptures in indigenous languages, it managed to carve an issue in escorting the Bengali minds to the extensive translations fixed books in vernaculars and English, and the most important of all, to discern the power of print capital in the diffusion of ideologies. <clears throat> the potential of the press induced people like Raja Ram Mohan Roy to follow the same path by publishing journals like Brahmanical Magazine and Bangadut. Just a small note that Bangadut was published in English, Bengali, Persian, and Hindi. Um, through these um, journals, Roy he, he channeled all his creative energies, first to, to thwart Kerry's conversion project, and second, to start a counter movement uh, uh, and to eradicate all the problems within Hinduism. So the first one was to thwart Kerry's conversion project, and second one was to eradicate the problems within Hinduism. Agra, Jabalpur, Mirzapur, Banaras also published uh, missionary periodicals and aptly supported by the government. The likes of Raja Ram Mohan Roy were the proponents of social and cultural awakening in the wake of Bengal Renaissance and utilized journalism to disseminate modern ideas in India. Udhav Martin, which was started in 1829, the first Hindi journal was published in Calcutta. It was followed by Bharat Mitra, Sar Sudhanidhi, Uchit Vakta, Sudhakar, Tattva Bodhini Patrika, and Satya Deepak. And, are, and there were many more, obviously. Considerably, many of the journals published in both Hindi and Urdu until the second half of the 19th century. Some of them were Gwalior Kagbar, Sarup Karak in Urdu, known as Mufid, -e Mufid Ul Khalik, Suraj Prakash in Urdu, known as Aftab -e Alam Taab, Bharat Khand Amrita in Urdu, known as uh, Arab -e Hayat -e Hind, and Malwa Akbar. Uh, bilingual publications were not exceptional, rather commonplace owing to the overlapping of two specific phenomena. <clears throat> Firstly, the presence of an established Urdu public sphere that ensured the required revenue to run the press. And second, the enthusiasm of the Hindi writers slash editors to create a Hindi reading sphere that motivated them to publish even at the cost of commercial loss. Hindi was far behind Urdu in terms of cultural reproduction and the development of a standard prose and prose idiom. 
Colonialism was bi uh, was bilingual and multilingual in some cases and gave way to the next phase of largely monolingual Hindi journalism. However, exceptions like Mauzir Narbada, which was a Hindi Urdu bilingual till 1887 and became a uh, Urdu, Urdu periodical afterwards. Next, of course, we come to Harishchand and the formation of Hindi public sphere. So Harishchand's Kaivachan Sudha, which was started in 1867, was a literary magazine that published uh, original poetry by Hindi poets. Um, uh, in the history of Hindi journal, uh, journalism, uh, it is generally asserted that the story of the development of journal journalism is the story of Bharat Hindu journalistic enterprises. So to follow that, I, I would just want to uh, na name a few of the prominent journals, which were uh, Harish Chandra Magazine, Harish Chandra Chandrika, Hindi Pradi, Bharat Jeevan, Bharat Mitra, Uchit Vakta, Bharat Hindu, Devanagri Pracharak, Hindustan, Brahman, Piyush Prava, Bharat Jeevan, Hindi Bangwasi. Bharat Bhushan, Kayast Vyavahar. The aforementioned journals were known for actively writing on the cultural and literary issues. Although the foregoing journals were monolingual, the same cannot be asserted about the journalist. It is important to emphasize that where Hindi could not publish a single daily newspaper. Sorry, Minakshi, uh, nine minutes more. Oh, already? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, could not publish a single daily newspaper, three daily newspapers in Urdu, Avad Akbar, Hindustani, and Rosanna Akbar were already publishing around 1883. The owners of, this, of these journals in this era were editors as well as writers. By the end of the 19th century, Hindi journalism came across as a discursive space where journalists, uh, writers, editors, because mostly one person was playing all these roles, discussed, debated, and tried to settle onto the correct expression of Hindi poetry and prose and continued to engage in 20th century as well. The reference alludes to the historical debate between these two editors uh, slash writers, that is Mahavir Prasad Duvedi, Saraswati fame, and Bab uh, Babu Mukund Mapun Bharat Mitra fame. Was a, both of them were basically editors of Saraswati and Bharat Mitra respectively on the idea of the uncertainty of language when the former wrote an article entitled Bhasha or Vyakaran on November 11, 1905 in Saraswati. A large share of credit of two developed prose in the H new Hindi was accredited to Saraswati. Dwedi's idea to forge a new linguistic identity included purging of all foreign idioms. It included tremendously to the larger debates on the ideas of the standard language and grammar, etc. The Hindi journalism in the late 19th century starts with heavy Braj Bhasha and Urdu influence, changes to a largely Sanskritized vocabulary in Harishchand period. period while retaining the spoken ethos of the language became essentially Sanskritized in the hands of a Saraswati fame Dwedi. When the new Hindi was trying to construct its public sphere in contrast to Urdu public sphere, English came across as the language of enlightenment, modernity, and opportunities in the colonial regime. The nationalist, religious, and colonial discourses contributed to the popularization of the language movements. The colonial cultural practices restructured the languages in hierarchy, wherein Hindi was at the top and Urdu and Hindi competed to secure the second best position. That is the standard vernacular, basically. Christian missionaries readily appropriated the print medium to enter into the sinews uh, of colonized society. The first step towards the endeavor was to choose the standard vernacular to know and be known by the natives. They were printing translation and producing textbook in vernaculars and English. Macaulay in 1835 proposed Western education and discarded the relevance of indigenous education systems. Report of the Education Commission 1882 traced the history of the development of education in India and recorded that around 1846, there was no systematic education system. Education was largely about religious discourses and vernaculars were the medium of instruction. According to the same report, the Halka Bandi or lower primary uh, vernacular schools were started by Mr. Alexander, collector of Mutra. His initiative, uh, uh, which was started as an experiment, was expanded to Agra, Bareilly, Ita, Itawa, Manpuri, Mutra, and Shahzapur by 1854. Hunter Education Commission 1882 recommended the introduction of English textbook in the education system and along with the vernacular um, education in Northwest province. There was a shift in colonial colonial perspective towards the relevance of vernacular languages from Macaulay to Hunter, and I'll just conclude in, two, in uh, 20 to 25 seconds. In the 19th century, when Kariboli was a uh, uh, step, sorry, Hadya. when Kariboli, uh, Hindi was struggling to establish itself as a standard vernacular, English was also trying to be the language of education and culture in India. 
where Hindi and Urdu were pitted against each other as contenders, English claim to superior superiority is derived from its colonial stake rather than any concrete function in religious, political, or cultural discourses. Consequently, it can be argued that English and indigenous languages were fighting their own battles to claim the respective titles of cosmopolitan and vernaculars. Ironically, most of the historiography and vernacular languages in South Asia, South Asia, India, presumes English as the cosmopolitan language, which was not the case with specific reference to 19th century. The post-colonial socio-political context are gently uh, demand to decolonize the accepted frameworks to define vernacular languages with a with English. And I, that's it. Thank you. I think I read, I read too fast. <laughs> Thanks so much. I mean, it was uh, incredible. And again, you know, uh, I have several things to ask you. And, you know, I suppose we are on time. So there are a couple of three questions, which I will again ask, you know, the raptors to handle. And maybe we can have that. Thank you, Manakshi. Very detailed. A lot of archival history, a lot of, lot of detailing. I'm still wrapping my head around it, but I'll ask the questions. And then there's a small question from me, if you'd like yeah, to take cool. it. So um, first is from Sango. He is curious to know what about the journals published in tribal areas, which were in vernacular languages. Kashish is asking about the journals in Braj Bhasha and the role they played in debates on standardization and vernacularization of Hindi. And then uh, would you like to comment on Sanskritization of Hindi language and how that worked as an impediment to the development of oral traditions in India? Okay, so I'll try to combine the first two questions and then try to answer that. First of all, uh, I think I forgot to talk about Khari Boli in, uh, uh, sorry, the Braj Pasha journals because I had to shorten my presentation. So I'll, I, I'll just name some of them. Uh, so there, there were many journals which were, uh, which started the initi initiative uh, to publish in Braj Bhasha. And there were many to name a few. There were uh, Rasik Lahari, there was uh, one Rasik Vinod and Rasik Rahasya. I'm just trying to find a publishing date. Yeah, Rasik, Ra Rasik Rahasya was being published in 1907. Rasik Vinod was uh, publishing, uh, started in 1904. And uh, around, the, around the same time, Rasik Lahari was also uh, started. So they, it, it, it was not like that they were silent and they were not publishing. They were also trying to, you know, contest uh, the uh, confrontation or sort of the right uh, which was taken away from them because Braj Bhasha was very, very popular on the same time. And then, uh, you know, uh, lo lo lots of people were speaking in Braj Bhasha. Re religious discourses was uh, very much predominated by Braj Bhasha and, you know, uh, so it was not like that, that they were not sort of contesting or not trying to uh, construct their own reading sphere. They were also part of the whole debate. So, yeah. Basically, we can just say, you know, to just comment further on that, that the standardization of languages with the assistance of print medium in itself, it's a very violent sort of process. It involves incorporation of other languages. In, in fact, the project to homogenize the varieties of Hindi uh, it it got backlash from the languages like Braj Bhasha and uh, Avdi and uh, someone asked about tribal lang tribal languages. So tribal language la tribal languages. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm I have not done much research on that, so I cannot really give you specific examples. But I know in oral cultures, for uh, they were starting to you know gather their sphere in terms of uh, that they were um, very much aware. I won't say that they were not aware as. Uh, as Bailey has also spoken on that, I think has written on that in idea of information systems that all these oral cultures, they have the specific information systems. But I cannot really comment upon that, whether they started publishing, you know, in the late, late, late 19th or early 20th century, because I think they didn't in terms of printing and publishing, but definitely they had their own specific in information systems. Okay, thank you, Manakshi. Uh, Ma'am, would you like to give concluding remarks or ask a few more questions? Mandwani, Ma'am. Uh, I was wondering, actually, uh, Professor Heather uh, was going to respond to the second question, and we said we'd take that on later. So if you want to go back to that, we have time for that right now. You know. uh, there yes, was yes. Um, this question by Sango. 
uh, would you say that the choice of languages and diversity of themes can attempt to not only find similarities between cultures, but also an attempt to locate herself outside the bounds of nationalisms? And that was exactly what uh, Femiza Ria is trying to do, especially, you know, through her Geets. Uh, you know, she's written poems like Purab Kabanka Chora, Meg Dut, Holi. Yes, uh, uh, you know, all these uh, Geets, you know, uh, and Geet is of Indian origin, you know, the kind of, uh, you were talking about orality versus textuality debates in uh, uh, languages and uh, uh, vernacular languages and in um, uh, so-called uh, state languages and, uh, you know, the kind of tussle and the conflict. This was what, uh, this is what uh, Femida Riaz was trying to do by incorporating the Indian uh, Hindi tradition of Geet in um, uh, Urdu poetry, she was showing um, the porosity of uh, the forms and the languages and, and the common origins and how beautiful um, diversification, you know, how, how beautifully the languages very seamlessly blend into each other and create something new. So, and yes, uh, and, and she could, you know, and this was, as Sango himself says, uh, a very, very, um, uh, I would say valiant attempt because being a Muhajir in Pakistan, her loyalty was always, all, almost always put into question. And in India too, she was seen as a Pakistani agent. And, uh, you know, and here she was mixing genres, mixing cultures, and um, uh, through her um, acerbic wit and humor, she was taking pot shots at uh, the garments in India and in Pakistan. So um, she was truly, you know, an organic intellectual, if you may. And she was trying, and this was some kind of an attempt to locate herself outside the bounds of borders. Uh, the borders of genres, the borders of languages. Uh, I hope I have answered your question, Sango. Uh, yeah, so I think one last, uh, you know, question uh, from me and from Minakshi, uh, you know, uh, is that, you know, in work, uh, of course, when we do a study of uh, Hindi literary history of any sort, we have to, like, make our way through Saraswati or, you know, to read and, and the, the, these like large parts of like the journal contain a lot of conversations about what it means to be Hindi, right? And what kind of Hindi ought to be promulgated and so on. So, uh, you know, you did bring up uh, these other languages that are also creating these, uh, you know, spaces for themselves in print culture, unfortunately not really succeeding. And, you know, you mentioned a few journals from say, Braj Pasha and so on. I was wondering if uh, you can bring up a few debates from uh, these spaces about what they are saying about what this Kariboli is, you know, because we, so, we see that in poetry, uh, but we don't see that in discourse really, perhaps, you know, as clearly. You know, if you have some examples. So I just want to ask something that uh, you, you, you're, you're asking this question particularly with specific reference to other, other languages or different cultures, because I have worked on caste journals for some time, so I can speak from that perspective, so. Uh, you know, from other languages and, you know, perhaps perspectives also will be very useful to. Okay, you know. so uh, different languages, as I just said that, uh, you know, Braj Bhasha and Avdi, they, they, were all, uh, they were also publishing in their own languages, but then there were other journals like caste journal. So for instance, there's one caste uh, and there is one Rajput and there, there, there is one uh, 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 Ahir Gazette. And there were many others. Specifically, I'm talking about uh, caste journals, upper caste journals, and there are some uh, coming from marginalized caste as well, not as full-fledged uh, uh, acknowledging their caste identity or, uh, or so. But of course, they were aware that how education and print was important to uh, acknowledge the, the role of. So yeah, that was important, but uh, and I'm just making an assertion here. I'm 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 not done my research. I'm 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 still in the process on this. But it's also true that where where these upper caste journals they were very much acknowledging uh, 
they, they were supporting this Sanskritized Hindi, basically Khari, the Khari Boli Hindi, the claim of Khari Boli Hindi, and they were also in support of the, the Sanskritized version of it, uh, of uh, the, that Hindi, but uh, for their own purpose, they just could not appropriate the same language. So I, I can just give you one example of this uh, journal that I have right in front of me, just happened to write in, in uh, front of me, Ra Rajput. So while they were claiming, they were in full support of uh, the Sanskritized Hindi, but they just could not use the same Hindi for the purpose of revenue gen generation because they needed money. They they need uh, uh, a, a reading spare, you know, to uh, generate revenue as well. So on the one hand, they were claiming that they were in full support support of the Sanskritized Hindi, Khadi Boli Hindi. They just could not appropriate the same language uh, in their own print publishing. So um, I think um, that partially answers uh, the question that there were there were debates. Uh, everything was in discursive uh, frame that time, and things were going on. But uh, not many journals, uh, you know, were coming forward to appropriate Hindi, Sanskritized Hindi, uh, if I can say, you know, Khadi Boli Hindi as their own language. And yes, there were definitely contestant contestation from other sides in terms of Braj Pasha Avdi. And uh, Urdu, too, of course, everyone is speaking about it. <laughs> well, thanks for that. Uh, I think I'd like to conclude. We were supposed to run till 4.15, right? Yeah. So um, thanks very much uh, for, well, you know, coming. Uh, there are several of you. There are four pages of you. Uh, and um, thanks to our three speakers uh, and 